Y'all, we're going to get right into the word. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Hakeem, my beautiful wife, uh, my kids. Um, y'all keep praying. My daughter is over in France, so y'all pray pray for her. Um, anybody in know French? I know I know. back in the day, French was the language you win. You know, you, you learn French, you know. And, and my dad would always be like, parlez-vous français, you know, and I don't know nothing. You know, I took French in like this. What did you say? Say it again. Yes, yeah, see, si, see, si, senor. Um, but yeah, so, but I'm, but I'm really thankful that she had the opportunity to go. And you know, one of the challenges is the fact that she's over there. I can't get right to her, you know. And, and so, y'all keep praying for her. Really, pray for me because I can't get right to her. And that is a little bit different. But she's enjoying her time over there. And we're just thankful for the actually the opportunity for her to be able to go. And it's exciting. Um, on behalf of Pastor Campbell, we're excited. We love them, my shepherds, first lady in their absence. It's just a pleasure to, you know, to stand before you. And, you know, we would say all of the ministers, elders, deacons, those in their respective places. You know, I just want to say thank you because you, you really could have been anywhere else. But we're going to get into the word. I don't have a lot of notes. Coop, don't keep shaking your head back there. I got a couple, but we need to get through them. And so I'm just truly excited. We're kind of wrapping up our Father's Day month. Y'all give it up for our fathers. Where are fathers? Where, where the men? Where all the men at? Where, are, where the men make some noise in here? Yeah. Oh, we say, where we do that again? Yeah. It's truly, truly, truly a blessing. Um, and we're going to read a little bit, and then we'll get into the Word. And if you know, I like to go through the Scriptures because I like to, you know, for people to understand exactly what we're reading about. And to give you something um, to focus on and pray on throughout the week. So if you have your Bibles, um, I'm going to read this part from the King James Version. Job 1, verses 1 through 5. Job 1, 1 through 5. And you can't keep your seat. Um, Job 1, verse 1 through 5. It says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that was a perfect and upright, and one that feared God and abstained from evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. It says, his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. It says, and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were going about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and burnt, offered burnt offerings according to the number of, of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job, thus did Job continually. continually. And we'll, we'll stop right there. And I know as we begin to talk about Job, I know it's a little different to think about Job in the sense of a father's message. But I need you for the title, if you will write this down, title of the message today is Standing on Business title of the message is standing on business and if you know if I'm really talking it'd be standing on business it wouldn't be business it'd be b-i-d-n-e-s-s anybody in here standing on business anybody anybody know what I'm talking about when I say you in here you standing on business amen look see you see here you'll see there he said I know what you say because I'm saying but we're gonna get to it but the thing that I began to realize, and as I prayed and I read the scripture, I was really baffled as God was giving, him, giving it to me to talk about Job as far as fathers they go, or as far as fathers go, but it's relevant story. See, the thing is, being a father is tough, y'all. Being a father, it is, it is difficult. And as a father, you're always, you're always trying to figure out if you're doing this thing right. You're trying to, you're, you're trying to figure out if you are enough, if, you, if enough is enough. You're trying to figure out if you taught your kids the right lessons, and you're trying to figure out if you gave them too much when you probably should have withheld from them, and, and they might be spoiled, and you, then you're trying to figure out um, if you didn't give them enough. You're trying to figure out, you know, how do you provide for your kids? You're trying to figure out if you're too hard on your kids. But then, you know, if you were raised around the time frame that I was raised, now you're trying to figure out if you're too soft on your kids. 
because you want to make sure that your kids have the ability to talk and, and you listen to them. But at the same time, sometimes you want them to not say nothing to you. Amen. And so you're constantly wrestling with how you were raised and what you said that you would not do when you become a parent. And so you're trying to kind of balance the two and how do I deal with kids and how do I deal with how I was brought up and then how do I discipline them based on all of these different things. And if you were, you were in, my, you know, in my age group demographic, maybe even a little older, you grew up watching the Cosby Show. Anybody watch the Cosby Show? All right, so you know that's unrealistic, right? You know, the mother is a, is a lawyer and the father is a doctor and they live in a brownstone in the middle of the town, but somehow they got a garage in the backyard and a basketball goal and, and they had all this, this big old house with a basement with an office in it and you're like, okay, that ain't realistic. All right, so then on the other side of that, you got uh, Sanford and Son. So you got Fred Sanford and then you got Lamont. And so you got him calling his son a big dummy. And then you got uh, Bill Cosby, who's making Theo act like he live in an apartment, right? So as a father, y'all know, I, I watch a lot, y'all. I don't watch some TV. I grew up around some grown people. So as you, as you are trying to put these two things together, you are trying to figure out where in there is your role and what's your job as being a father and taking care of your kids. And, and the thing is, no, none of us men, and maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if many of us men grew up thinking about what we would be as a father. Anybody grew up playing house? You grew up playing house? See, now the men in here, they ain't going to admit it. We were okay with playing house because we were good with being a husband. But we won't never trying to figure out, okay, well, when I, when I have my kids, what am I going to do, right? And even as, as you find out uh, your significant other, your spouse is pregnant, the mother has a nine months to get used to the idea of being a mother. But you just, as a father, you're just doing regular stuff. You're building a crib. You're painting a room. The mother is bonding with the child. And so then after those nine months, now you just got a baby. And as a father, it's tough because... It's very difficult because you're not always taught how to be a father. You, never, you, you don't really understand what goes on with trying to raise your child. I moved out of my house to go to UNCW at 17 years old. All I knew was I wasn't going to ever live in that house again. It did not matter what happened. I would stay in Wilmington during hurricanes. I would stay when the school closed down. I would get my job to write notes because I didn't know, and you don't know how to interact sometimes with the father, especially as you get older. So being a father is tough because there are books now, but when Isaiah was born, y'all, I was still, I, I mean, I'm, he's 19 years old, and I'm still trying to figure out where to give, where to let him figure out his own way, where to let him make his mistakes, where to guide him, where to guide him even more harshly. You know, because at this point, I'm out of the just simply teaching him phase. And he's got to go and begin to make mistakes on his own. And as a father, it is difficult, y'all. And nobody wants to be Job. I've never heard a person say, you know what? My favorite character in the Bible that I would love to be like is Job. We always talk about Job with faith and endurance and patience and all that. But nobody's ever sitting around like, you know what? I want to be like Job today. You know why? Because nobody wants that testimony. Everybody wants to be able to say that God blessed them with everything, but don't nobody want to lose nothing. So as I began to study, I was trying to figure out, well, God, how is it that you want me to talk about Job and fatherhood? But the thing is, Job, y'all, stood on Business. Look at somebody and say, I'm standing on business. And these Chanel shoes. No, you don't have to say the rest. But I'm standing on business. And the more I looked at it, the more I began to realize that Job did things that all of us fathers should be doing. So as I began reading, although we remember Job for, for his faith and his trust in God, I began to recognize the effort that Job had as a father. And though he ended up losing and having to deal with the loss of his kids, the things that he did as a father, we want to begin to remember. If I died today, even if I was rich, if I died today, 
I wouldn't want to be remembered for my riches. I would want you to remember me. As I would want you to say he loved God. I would want you to say he was a good husband to Alexia. And I would want you to say that he was a good father to his kids, to my kids. I would want you to say that I did everything that I could do to take care of whatever it was that God gave me. And, y'all, that's what Job did. Amen? So all of the money, all of the houses, you could take all of the houses, all, you could take each one of our houses, you could take the car, you could take all of that stuff. I want my family and my kids to remember that as a father, I did everything that I could do to take care of them. I got any fathers like that in here? Any fathers like that? Just show your hands. If you, if you want to go down and know, you want your family to know, lift your hands real big because I want you to look around and see that all the money, none of that stuff matters. We want to make sure that we go down and our family knows that we did everything that we could do. So just so you know, I mean, I started researching standing on business. There's a lot of, a lot of hip-hop and rap songs. But USA Today, you know, who is really the aficionado in urban language, right? USA Today says standing on business means to take care of your responsibilities or put your money where your mouth is. It says you get done what needs to be done, and you follow through, and it is similar to taking care of business. So some of us might say, well, I'm taking care of business, but our new age is going to say I'm standing on business. So let's, so let's look at Job. So, so as we look at the scripture, there are a couple things that I want to point out that Job did as a father that we should be doing as men. But let's look at Job. So Job was the third son of Issachar, and I usually say this in the beginning. Y'all, I go through a lot of notes, so if y'all got a note-taking app, if you got Google Notes, if you still using the legal, legal, anybody still using the legal pad? Y'all got still use a good legal pad? You know, you got, got, yeah, got a good little notebook, you know? If you still actually have pen and paper, you know, with, but you can use Evernote, you can use Audio Note, you can use all of these notes. I'm not going to get into the other debate that I would normally get in, Don Terrio. Um, but it's for those people that have to type the word liked in your text messages because they can't actually use the tap back function. I'm so sorry. All right, so let's keep going. So Job was the third son of Issachar, and he was from the land of Uz. Job was a, he was a husband. He was a father. Um, the scripture says that Job was perfect and upright. It says, now, now the thing is, if this was me, it would probably say Isaiah was all right, but he at least told the truth, you know. So I'm not exactly Job, but I'm, but I'm trying. It also says that he is one that feared God and abstained from evil. Fathers, it is important for us as the example for our families to abstain from evil. We'll get back to that in just, in just a second. So Job was a man that was perfect in the eyes of God. He was ethical. He was moral. And he was wealthy. Now, if that ain't a good example of a father, I don't know what is. Job 1 and 3 says, his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen, which typically means there were two oxen, um, it said, and 500 she asses and a very great household. So this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. If we looked at Job's wealth in today's terms, Job would be worth $33.9 million. Somebody said, go ahead, Job. Job was worth $34 million. When I started looking it up, it was people like uh, Willie Mays and Jackie Chan. So not only was he perfect in the eyes of God, he was moral, he abstained from evil, but he was wealthy enough to be able to take care of his kids. That's what I want to be able to do, amen? Anybody want to be able to follow those simple steps as a father? Anybody? Job initially had 10 children, seven sons and three daughters, and they're mentioned at the beginning of the book of Job as part of his wealth and blessings. So fathers, your kids are also part of your wealth and your blessings. I know oftentimes we try to take account into how many houses we got or how much money we have, but the fact that you have the ability to have kids, 
that is part of your wealth. And just like God has given us the responsibility to take care of our money, he has given us the responsibility to take care of our children. Because it is a blessing to have children. Now, the situation that they may have come out of may not be what you think, but it is a blessing to be a father. Any fathers love their kids? If you don't, don't raise your hand. Don't even worry about it, y'all. Don't. But any fathers know that it is truly a blessing. And I know they get on your nerves sometimes. I know they want to go somewhere because we in the summer. Anybody got kids at home for the summer? And they want to do something as soon as they wake up at 1 o'clock. Now, they'd have been asleep all day long. But at 1 p.m., now you got to drop everything you're doing because they got basketball practice, right? And they ain't done nothing to get ready for this basketball practice. So you got to drop what you're doing to get them there, amen? And then they don't put their shoes on until they get in the gym because for some reason, basketball players, correct me if I'm wrong, like to walk in the gym with their slides on, and then they sit down, and then they put their shoes on so their shoes don't get messed up in the gym. Is that right? Amen. So, so now you, rode, you done rode 35 minutes with your kids in the car, and they ain't got no shoes on. And when you get to the gym, you like, can y'all get out the car? So you love your kids. But sometimes your kids will try you. And let's be real, sometimes we try our kids too. So some of us can't let some of the stuff go that happened in our past. So we on our kids back about stuff that we can't control either. But that's another, that's another message. I'm talking about the fathers today, Isaiah. So, so you can get me when it's your turn. Amen. But the thing is, with all that Job had, Job still had time to be a father. With everything that he had done, Job took time to concern himself with his kids. Don't answer this. Fathers, are you taking time to concern yourself with your kids? Some of our kids need more attention than other kids. Some of our kids are super independent. My daughter's in France right now, and, and I, it, I would have never thought about doing something like this. But somehow she's able to ride the train and the bus. She never rode the train and the bus over here. But somehow she's able to ride the train over in France. So some of our kids are different. And so we have to pay a little bit more attention to some of our kids. But fathers, with everything that we got going on, don't let work get you so caught up that you can't take time to spend with your kids. Amen. You won't go get that time back. And what I don't want is for my kids to remember that my father worked all the time but didn't have time to spend with me. So at least once a week, I try to plan to shoot basketball with David. Now, sometimes playing basketball, he don't want to play with me no more because I get to coach him and not just being a dad. And I have to work on that. That's something I got to work on. Isaiah would be the same way every now and then. He'd be like, you know what, I don't even want to hit the baseball. Just forget it. If you're going to be there, I don't want to play. And I would be like, well, I'm trying to spend time with you. And he looking like, I don't want you to spend time with me. Go spend time with your daddy. I believe, I believe that's what he said, too. I, he, actually, he might have said it to me one time under his breath, though. But I believe he did say it. So let's look at what Job did, and we're going to get out of here, y'all. So, so let's look at Job. Let's go back to Job 1 and 5. It says, and it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them. For, for Job said, it may be, you can underline, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did this continually. The first action, the first thing that I want you to Please keep in mind that you should do as a father. You need to pray for your kids. Pray for your kids. Point number one, action number one. I want you to make sure you pray for your kids. Y'all, the world is crazy right now. And we love to say that the kids are dealing with stuff that we never had to deal with. But the truth is, a lot of the stuff they're dealing with is the same stuff that we dealt with. The difference is they don't have, they didn't have social media. But a lot of the stuff that my kids are dealing with right now, Lex and I can say, we dealt with this, you know, however many years ago Lex is old because I'm still young. Because um, she be telling me I'm old. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't let that smooth taste fool you. She be looking at me. She be like, that's you, them old bones. I be like, my knee hurts. She be like, no, nah, Zay, you're just getting old. So, but no, I mean, stuff that we dealt with 35 and 40 years ago, our kids are dealing with it right now. They're just dealing with it 
in a different place. You can see it. Now you got a history. Now you got an algorithm that tells you. You got bullying that's going on online. So it is important for you to pray for your kids. Look at somebody say, pray for your kids. It's very important. See, this might not be a big deal for somebody, but so often the mother is the one doing the praying. And the fathers are ready to fight. And any fathers in here that got hands, y'all say, but y'all got hands. And y'all ready to rock and roll every time something happens to your kids. But the thing we can't forget, fathers, it is that our responsibility to pray over our families. Verse 5, it says, and it was so when the days they were feasting, it said, that Job sent and sanctified them. It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed in their heart. Now, the scripture does not suggest that they were sinning or overindulging, but it is the fact that Job was so concerned with his children that he interceded for them. It is important as a father, even in times that your kids are not aware of what is going on around them, that you begin to intercede for them. It is our responsibility as the head and as the spiritual figure in our families to support and cover our kids in prayer. Amen? So in other words, Job served as the spiritual head of his kids. We oftentimes let our kids figure out religion. We let them figure out their Christianity, but we tell them to do everything else. We teach them how to cook. We teach them math. We tell them they got to go to school. We tell them that they got to be home at a certain time. But then we say, well, if you're tired, you don't have to go to church in the morning. We get to the dinner table. We say the prayer because we don't think they pray like we want them to pray, so we don't teach them how to pray. Make your kids pray over their food. Teach them how to ask God. You know, it is our responsibility, fathers, to set these type of standards in our kids' lives. Don't raise your hand, but how many times do we lead our kids and we say stuff like, do as I say, not as I do? It's your responsibility to be better than me. So it kind of takes the the pressure off of us as parents. But But here's the thing. We tell them to pray and fast, but do we? We tell our kids, you ought to tithe, but do we? We tell our kids, you ought to go to children's Bible study, but do you go to big Bible study? It is our job as our father, as a father, to be the spiritual head and cover our kids in prayer. Amen? And it starts with prayer. And it's not real complicated. It's just covering your kids in prayer. The reason he burnt offerings were for an atonement for sin symbolizing purification. It's not that your kids can't pray, but while they're in their household, you should be covering them. And even when they get out, you should still be praying for your kids. Y'all heard mother the other week. Mother was like, I am praying for Terry, y'all. She said, Terry ain't listening. I believe, I believe that's what she said. She said, now Terry ain't listening, but I'm still praying for her. And I know Pops is doing the same thing. Pops, I know you're praying for your kids. Amen? And the aroma of the burnt offering is often described as a pleasing aroma to the Lord, indicating God's acceptance of a worshiper's offering and a worshiper's heart. So in other words, Job worshiped on behalf of his kids. Sometimes I say, if you can't praise them for nothing, uh, you can't praise them for nothing you got going on, come on, praise them for what I got going on. It, it is the responsibility. Worship is what you place value on. So you can come to God and worship God for taking care of your children. It's our responsibility as fathers to cover our kids in prayer. And I don't want to get caught up in Job's suffering the fact that this man, every time they did something, he prayed for them. Not just one of them, 
but he burnt offerings for all of them, which means he had 10 kids. You know how much praying that is? I got three. I can't imagine praying for 10. My grandmother had 17. Y'all, listen, I'm trying to tell y'all, she had a lot of wealth, I guess, you know. Her and my granny had a whole bunch of wealth. But it's your responsibility to pray. But Job worshiped on behalf of his kids. Look at, if you got it, look at Ephesians 6. We're going to read 1 through 4. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. And you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it. It says, children, obey your parents. I want you to highlight, in the Lord. Okay? In the Lord. All right? For this is right. Now, that's what we use. We stop right there. We say, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. But we emphasize the children obey your parents. The key that I want you to pay attention to, fathers, is in the Lord. It says, honor thy mother and father. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. The key things is, fathers, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, which is God's responsibility to us to bring our young people up in what we would say the fear and admonition of God. By the time Isaiah gets 19 and I start trying to preach to him, it might be too late. He didn't heard everything. But I would tell you at a young age, we started teaching him how to go to God and how to ask for God and how to worship God. Now, he may not get the relationship until he gets older, but I have done my best to bring my kids up in the fear and the respect of God, and it's Father's responsibility to do so. Amen? So let's keep moving. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to get on out of here in just a few. It's, as I was reading, um, I kept wondering, how did Joe get so rich? You know, I would, you know, you know how you do. You see somebody that's got money, they got cars, they got a nice house. You'd be like, what kind of job they got? And, and don't, don't act like I'm the only one. If we go outside right now and somebody got a Tesla, somebody else say, do you know what such and such does? Or if somebody got a real nice house, then you'd be like, oh, where such and such and such work at? You know, such and such is what, you know, you say when you don't know what to say. But we get to talking. Am I the only person that do that? You try to figure. Look, let's just be honest. You ride through a nice neighborhood, you pull up Zillow, and you trying to figure out how much the houses cost in that neighborhood. Some of y'all laughing, but y'all know. And then you start trying to figure out, well, I wonder how they can afford a house so nice. Well, she don't look like, and you know, HGTV, you know, it'd be like, well, I, you know, I pull yarn and I cut grass on Tuesdays and I budget for our houses, $1.9 million, right? You'd be trying to figure out how, and so I was reading the scripture because nobody ever told me. I was trying to figure out how did Job get so much wealth? So I'm over here like, okay, so let's turn, we're going to read it. Let's go, to, let's turn back to Job 1. We'll read verse 10. And this is where Satan is talking to God about what it will take for Job to give in. And it says, hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed, I want you to highlight this, thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. I need you to highlight the work. Because my second point is teach your kids how to work. The second action that we have got to do as fathers is teach our kids how to work. We got to pray for them. Amen. Lord, bless my kids. Cover my kids. Second thing we got to do, it's time for y'all to get up and go to work. Teach your kids how to work. I've got fathers in here right now that have asked me, can my kid come work with you some for the summer? Because they understand how important it is for our children to have a good work ethic. See, the thing is, Job was not just blessed because God rained down all these cattle and all these sheep and all these calves. But the scripture said that God blessed the work of his hands, and his substance was increased 
in the land. We got to begin as fathers to teach our kids if it is something that they want, they got to work for it. And what happens as fathers is, especially if you had a, you know, a mediocre or, or you didn't have money growing up, you spend your whole time trying to give to your kids. But we negate teaching them how to work for what they get. And some of our kids don't have the same privilege as others. One of the things that I say a lot is raising middle class kids is one of the toughest things to do because they don't have the money to fall back on that upper class or higher class kids have, and they don't have the grit and the work ethic that lower, kid, lower class kids have. So the kids in the middle, we spoil them, and we don't teach them how to work for what they get because we're trying to give them everything that the upper class got so they don't have to work as, class, as hard as the lower class. But fathers, it's your responsibility to teach your kids how to work. My kids might not like it. Matter of fact, they probably don't. But they have to learn how to work. Look at somebody and say, they need to go to work. Now look, look at somebody else and say, they need to go to work. You ever wonder why the chores in your house ain't done? Because you don't make them do them. You on the game, they on the game. And if you, you, if you know what I mean by on the game, if you're on a PlayStation, the Xbox, or whatever, you switch, whatever, you on the game, they on the game. You on the phone, they on the phone. You eat out a lot, they eat out a lot. And they don't have the same income coming in as you. So now they sitting right beside you on the game, on the phone, and eating out all the time, but you the one going to work. And I know some of y'all laughing, but some of y'all are dealing with this right now. You go home, the trash ain't empty. The dishes ain't what Look, they might not be washed at my house right now. You know, I'm, I'm still working. I'm a work in progress. Amen. But you are the example to your kids. Show them how to get this work done. Proverbs 22 and 6, NIV version says, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not depart from it. See, we refer to this scripture a lot as it relates to church. But this scripture also expresses the importance of instilling good habits and values in our kids from a young age. So, yes, train up a child in the way they should go. And what we like to say here is they'll come back to church and be saved and sanctified. Not just that, though. Train up a child in the way that they should work. And you ain't got to worry about them being lazy later. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Your kids don't want to work because you don't like to work. That's hard, man. That's rough. I'm sorry. It's, my dad would be like, it's tight, but it's right. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Teaching your kids to work diligently and with integrity as if they were serving the Lord encourages a strong work ethic. I don't care if they're on the basketball court. I don't care if they empty the trash. If the trash ain't empty right, empty the trash again. If the floor ain't vacuumed right, vacuum the floor again. Anybody, I know some of us, we knew now, we're young, we don't, we don't dust, right? Nobody, you don't dust no more. But if you ain't dust right, then dust again. You know, now we got all this the technology stuff, but I, I mean, we used to have a pledge, and, and you get, uh, you know, we didn't have all the microfiber towels. You know, you get an old bath towel um, that you don't really wash with no more, that you don't put on this shelf, you put down there at the bottom, because they're real thin, because you don't wash them in bleach. They might not even be the same color, right? But, but if you ain't dust right, then you get that rag and you go dust again. Put your kids to work. And I'm not, and I ain't, now y'all, I work like a D-A-W-G. Y'all think I'm playing? We did not have weed eater. We did not. And so y'all know I had to cut around the base of our house with scissors. Don't, don't talk to me about work. 
We, we, this ain't even something. I cut the grass twice a week. Our yard was big as this, that stand right there. But my dad would be like, you need to cut that grass. And he would be like, you need to cut that grass before I get back to this house. And we didn't have no cell phone, so my best bet was to go ahead and cut that grass soon as he said it. He didn't care how hot it was. He didn't care about none of that. My dad worked in a factory. He worked at a glass plant. It was over 100 degrees every day he went to work. So he did not care that it was 86 degrees and I didn't want to cut this little patch of grass. My father taught me how to work. Isaiah runs our jet ski company. It's hard work. Last week, I tried to slow him down. I was like, Isaiah, man, the tide is low. You don't need to be out there cutting up your feet. He said, look, you might as well go and open the books up because we need to, we're losing money by scheduling around the tide. That young man knows how to work. David just bought his first iPhone. You hear what I'm telling you? David ordered his first iPhone because David be out there flying the drone. David be out there pulling them jet skis around, and he be out there walking in the mud during low tide just like I did. It's important to teach your kids how to work. Now, I gave, I gave David $100. Is they, are they out? They, are, they might be out. I don't know if they're in the back. I gave David $100. But David earned enough money so far over the summer to be able to buy him a phone. And I'm thankful because Sanaya won't going to let us live it down if we had bought David a phone. So, David, I'm glad that you were able to earn that money. Amen? But it's important to teach your kids. Y'all, we spend so much time trying to give our kids everything that we forget that we got to teach them that they got to work for stuff. Y'all, I love my kids. My kids, you know, they, and, and they work my nerves. I work their nerves too. But I love my kids, but I'm, it is my responsibility to pray for them. It's my responsibility to teach them how to work. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. One thing my father will never have to ask me about. I told my wife, we're in the process of making some changes. I said, you ain't going to be talking about me like no bum. I'm going to work. I'm going to do everything I can do to take care of this family. I will do what I have to do so that my family can do what they want to do. Because it's my responsibility as a father to go to work. Look at somebody and say, it's time to go to work. We good. I got, I got one more point. We good, though? Everybody, we good? But we make it so complicated. We make we make it complicated, and it is tough, but we make it complicated. So let's look back up at Job 1 and 1. It said, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and one that abstained or shewed evil. Y'all, Job was righteous. You know, we say stuff like holiness is still right. It is still, righteousness is still right, which means he abstained from actions, behaviors, or thoughts that were morally wrong or sinful. He stayed away from unrighteousness, and he stayed away from idolatry. So action number three or point number three for fathers, and it encompasses everything, it is your responsibility to set the example. Point number three, action number three, is set the example. What do your, and I don't want you to answer, but what do your kids see you doing? What do your kids see you doing? Are you praying and worshiping at home so they can see it? Do you accidentally walk out the store and go back in the store and pay for what you took by accident? Are you making your home a peaceful place for your entire family to be? Do you forgive first? Are you forgiving? Or do you hold grudges? Are you saying, you know, if you walk out the store with something and they didn't see it, you say, well, they should have caught it because I'm out of here now. Are you still claiming people kids on your taxes and not claiming the cash uh, that you take in on your business so you can keep your income tax down? Y'all like, oh, Lord. Y'all know people take cash and don't claim it because they don't want their income to look like it's up. But then when it's time to get a loan, you can't get it because it look like you ain't made no money. Are you cussing people out in front of your kids and then not understanding where they get it from? 
Are you out here wilding in the streets and then telling your kids they can't do it because they ain't grown yet? You slapping your kids in the face and then wonder why they got anger issues at school? Or are you loving on your kids and teaching them how to, how to, how to de-escalate situations? It is our responsibility as fathers, and I'm not, I'm, it, mothers, y'all had y'all whole month, but right now I'm talking to fathers. Fathers, it is your responsibility to live upright in front of your kids. It is important that they see a man love his wife. It is important that they see a father love his daughter. It is important that they see you go to work. It's important that they see how you act when you get tired. It's important for your kids to see how you manage stress. Because you are the example for your kids. If you get, if you get stressed out and you slamming on the desk, then guess what they're going to do at school? You getting a call from that teacher. They're going to be sitting up there in that office. But Job abstained from actions and behaviors or thoughts that were morally wrong. Y'all, it is important that you set an example for your kids. Ephesians 5 and 1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Now, this is not him talking to the kids. This is talking, this is talking to, this is what we should be doing. It says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becoming saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving thanks. This is the example that we also have to set for our young people. What do you think, what do you think they're taking their lead from? What do you think our kids are learning how to argue, and some of them learning how to cuss, and some of them learning how to cheat, and some of them learning how to steal? And some of them learning how to drink. And some of them learning how to smoke. And some of them learning how to lie. And they learning it from the parents. Now, I know we like to think our babies are angels, right? And so whatever they learn, they got it from that schoolhouse. You know, that's what we say. They got it from that damn schoolhouse. Or they got it from that internet, right? You know how we say that? They got it from that internet. But our kids are watching us all the time. They watching how you talk to your wife. They watching how you talk to your mama. They're looking at the relationship you got with your, with your parents. Your kids are sponges that are soaking up everything that you do. Matter of fact, if you're married and your kids see your marriage, that's their first relationship. That's their first example of a married couple they see. What are we showing our kids as fathers? And mothers, we'll get to y'all in 2025. But, but fathers, right now, this is your time. But I'm done. Hakeem, we can get on the key. We're about to get out of here. But in conclusion, father, fatherhood, y'all, y'all, it is difficult. But we make it harder because we make it so complex. We create, you know, these images that we want our kids to see. We want to give them everything. And although Job did things right, there were still some things that was out of Job's control. He provided. He prayed. He worked. And even when you do all of that, sometimes things don't go right. Job ended up losing his whole first set of kids. He lost all ten kids. He was good to his kids. He served God. He was faithful. And the thing that I need you to understand, Father, is I'm not asking you to be perfect. But the thing I'm asking you to do is try. I'm asking you to stand on business on behalf of your kids. And the thing I need you to know is even when something happens that is outside of what you prayed for them for. 
even when they don't come up and they don't marry the person that you think they should, even if their sexuality isn't what you think it ought to be, even if they're not interested in the same things, it ain't your, it's, not your, it's not your job to wonder if it was your fault. All you can do is the best by your kids and do what God has commanded you to do. And if something happens, then you did your part. And even as they get older, guess what you're still supposed to do? Even when they stray away, you know what you're supposed to do? Keep praying for them. Keep praying for them. If your kids are doing or they're involved in a lifestyle that you don't like, guess what you're supposed to do? Pray for them. Don't stop praying for your kids. Your kids need to be covered in your prayer. At 46, 56, 66, Terry, however old you are, whatever. Pops, you keep praying for her. Pat, you keep praying for your grown kids. Valerie, I know you got grown kids. Don Terrio, you got babies. You keep praying for them kids. And even if they don't act like you expect them to act, you keep praying for your kids. Please stand to your feet. Ministers, if you would come. As we get out of here today, as we close, 